As I think about the Purdue organization, the first thing that comes to my mind is the emphasis on quality. Frank had a passion for quality. It was just his mainstream, quality. I think their emphasis on quality, and um, they were almost crazy about quality. I mean, if a consumer would call in about a quality issue, I mean, like, there was a group of people on it. And I appreciated that. What the associates and the company can't lose is what got us here today. And that is being a quality company producing a quality product. Because that is going to be, that's the past, the present, and it will continue to be the future. Frank always wanted to be growing, always wanted to be doing something. And most of it was successful. You know, Frank measured everything, you know? You inspect what you expect. You measure, 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 measure. When I came with a company, I mean, you, you knew when you came, you were gonna work hard, and you were gonna work long hours, and you were gonna do what you were told, and, you know, you were gonna, you were gonna make the best of it. Um, I didn't have any problem adapting to that because I almost felt like I was still working for my father. My father and Frank Purdue were a lot alike. I mean, they measured everything. They, they never were happy. If you did it in 10 minutes, do it in nine. If you, uh, I mean, it was constantly improve, improve, improve. And that's what the company, that's why the company succeeded. I don't think you can, you know, reach a plateau and feel satisfied because there's people out there that's gonna gain on you or try to surpass you. And that's, you, you've got to be number one to be the most successful. I mean, that's the way it operates, and that's, that's the way Purdue had, had been for years, and I think still are. Even in quality, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's times where I believe we did things that other companies would have taken a low road on that we always took the high road. If it didn't look good, change the standard. He wanted to make sure he's got the best product on, in, on the market. I wouldn't want any associate coming in now not to realize that this company only does what's right. And if we make a mistake, we fix it right away. We own up to it and we make it right. And that's what I think has made our company great is, is we're never complacent, you know? We always can improve. Continual improvement has is, is, is been what's the lifeblood of this company. There may have been some as good, but there was never any, any better than what we, or more consistent than uh, what we provide. Purdue has the very best chicken nuggets out on the market. I'm not just saying that because I grow for Purdue. I'm saying that because I have eat both kinds and Purdue has the best tasting chicken. Uh, as I recall, the farmers were not real happy back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there were a lot of farms, but they were all small trucks. Most of them were six wheelers. And they would go to a grain elevator and wait for hours and hours to get unloaded. And Frank says, we're not, we're not gonna have that. We're gonna build an elevator, we're gonna receive grain, and we're gonna get these trucks turned around. Because if we can turn those trucks around, we'll get the grain. But everybody was coming to Purdue because he could get you unloaded, where a lot of these smaller places, you may have been sitting in line for quite a while. And uh, Frank was a lot to do with that. He, he, he would have articles in the paper, so-and-so said, well, I got unloaded in 12 minutes, you know, at Purdue. I was in and out in 12 minutes. And, and you saw a lot of your neighbors were dealing with them, and, and so, you, it made you made feel a little bit more comfortable because you knew other people that were dealing with Purdue also. When Frank would come to visit uh, the Green Elevators, there was always one thing on his mind, uh, how long the lines were, how long people was having to wait, why were they having to wait, and what can we do to speed it up? 
Well, he would come in and he'd look at the sheets where we've been uh, testing the grain, see what kind of moisture we've been running. He'd also talk to a few farmers. Then he would go around back and get his stopwatch out and he would actually sit there and see how long it took to empty a truck. When was the next one pulling on? We've been dealing with Purdue since Golly, I guess in the early 60s when we started. We have stayed with Purdue because of the service we can get. We think the fact that they were the first to advertise and successfully market a brand name chicken, I mean, that has to be uh, one of the top important things because people were saying that couldn't be done because everybody's saying chicken is a chicken. Uh, yeah, chicken is a chicken. And so the fact that he branded it and differentiated Purdue with, you know, the bigger breast and the yellow skin, um, I think that, again, just critical to us becoming a household name, building that brand to where people said, I want my Purdue. Where do I get the Purdue? He's, Purdue was chicken. There wasn't any other chicken, it was Purdue. Purdue now is a name and you've built a trust, right? You got people who say, it's Purdue, so I trust it. So we got to capitalize on that. I do remember another another Frank Purdue story is the first time I got the speech, you know, uh, and that's that's the speech that the consumer buys a chicken one at a time, and Frank didn't care about percentages. He taught me a lot there as far as that piece, as far as his vision of what quality was to the consumer, and how passionate he was. He was definitely passionate when it came to that that subject. Frank's memory, his attention to detail was, was incredible. He always took notes, copious notes. Well, I, for me, it was um, Purdue's dedication to growth and also the innovation part of it. They were extremely dedicated to innovation because they knew innovation led to growth of the company. Basically and generally, Purdue has tried to stay on the edge of what the consumer needs and wants. Um, everything is convenience now. I mean, I remember my mom cooking like half a day for dinner that night, and the next morning get up and cook half a day for dinner that night. And people are working, couples are working. So you don't have the day at home to cook anymore. And I think Purdue has tried to realize that over the years and make things easier for the parent um, getting dinner for the family. But I think that kind of encompasses just about everything. One of the most important things that we've done, I think, has been eventually we, uh, that we finally got to the point where uh, we branched out into other protein. Early on, Frank, had his finger on everything and you know the monthly report would come out and of course everybody had goals and if the goal wasn't met you'd get a note or a call from Frank why did this happen what are we going to do about it when will this be corrected when do you think you're going to make goal and I mean he leaned on you. their vision was was um, Quality, service, reliability. I mean, that, that's what that's what the company was built around. It really was. Uh, it was a great company to work for. When you think of Purdue, you you think of quality, and it's not just quality of the product. That that you have to have that. But I think it's just in the things you do, the way you treat people. Uh, I think that's part of our, the culture at Purdue, uh, you know, doing things right. When they found out you were with Purdue, um, they treated you with the utmost respect and they opened doors uh, for you. Uh, your product was good. Um, the legitimacy of the company was always without question. And, um, and I think all of those things wrapped together helped make me realize that the company was offering me a career and not just a job. They stayed true 
to their vision of being best in class. I never saw Purdue do anything that would devalue the product to the consumer. I think that's a very important thing for a company, particularly one that's private like Purdue with your name on the package. You gotta stay true to your heritage and your beliefs. Frank always told me, said, you don't want to be the first to do something, but you don't want to be last also. So somewhere in the middle is where he tried, and he tried to be a leader, which he was. One of his comp competitors told me one time, he said, if it hadn't been for Purdue making us sharpen our pencils, we'd all be out of business. The thing about it was, and I, and I was always told, he said, whatever he asked you, don't never lie to the guy. He said, because chances are he already knows the answer before he's called you. And you better be ready for that. With the integrity, you don't lie, you, you're transparent on everything that you do, and you make decisions for the right reasons. It was, it was kind of interesting, hard, uh, to get people to understand how, how important it was to be, uh, to doing things right the first time, and to, and to do them right, and not be afraid of failure. Uh, Frank was always, if you don't try something, you're never gonna know if you can do it or not. And getting people to understand it was okay, you didn't have to win every time, but as long as you learned from your mistakes and you moved forward, that was a good thing. And, and Frank pushed that a lot. I think you have to start working hard uh, and uh, you know do do things right, uh, not be afraid to make a mistake. You know, when you make a mistake, you go back and fix it and and learn from that. Well, we've always continued to work with Purdue because of honesty and cooperation. The uh, culture of Purdue has always been to be upfront with people and uh, try to do it in the right way. Uh, and I've always found that they have. Some of the things that stand out to me is the importance of strong work ethic and doing the right thing. That was always something that Frank and Jim wanted. Strong work ethic, do the right thing. What made us most proud to work for Purdue? And uh, well, together, Elaine and I are proud to have been associated for 67 of the 100. Now, the bulk of those are held by Elaine. But 67 out of 100 years is, uh, and that was directly, well, until yeah. Frank died with Frank, and of course, continuing on with others. <clears throat> Purdue is a company with the same core values that we believe in. It was a company that had integrity. Uh, they believed strongly in family values, believed in God, believed in country, and and everybody there uh, just seemed to want to work hard to help achieve whatever you know was taking place. And everybody's worked at Purdue sometime. Yeah, it seems yeah. like yeah. We think the best illustration of the values of Purdue are best expressed in Frank's ethical will that he left to his children, grandchildren, present and future family members. Uh, we think that really covers it all. For 100 years, to think that the core values of the founder, Mr. Arthur, it's been kept alive by Frank and Jim. And that, that has to be a real accomplishment our company. One thing he told me early on is in order to be successful in life, you have to work hard, uh, put in a good day's work, and be honest. When I think about my relationship, our relationship with the Purdue organization, the thing that I value probably more than anything else is the integrity and the increasing transparency that they have demonstrated. With Purdue, I was never asked to do anything that I thought was unethical. Um, the integrity of the company is something that's always been important to me. This was a company that always did the right thing, and I never felt any moral pull to say, God, I, I can't do that. I never, in my career, I can't think of one time that I was ever asked or ever expected or ever felt that I need to do something um, that's not sitting real well in here. And because we always try to do what's right, I'd walk the talk, you know? My word, if I gave my word, I would do that. 
Frank would say, you know, if you gave your word, we're doing it. If it's costing us money, it's costing us money, and you'll learn from it. You know, the company was always a believer in passion. And if you didn't have the passion to say, look, here's why this is important, and if you didn't fight for it, um, you had no chance of getting it. Even if it was a great idea, he said, well, you don't have the passion for it, so why should I have the passion for it? Because listen, Frank, when he had something on his mind, now he could keep after you until, well, it just drive you crazy. Well, I, I think Elaine and I, we agree that we thought it was the most wonderful opportunity because we worked directly with Frank, not way down the line. We worked directly with him and you always knew what the exciting thing was that was happening. And you also had, you knew of what was about to happen or what was supposed to happen. So I was able to work with one of the most notable marketing geniuses of all time, and that's Frank Perdue. And, and that's the one thing that stands out to me. I watched him maneuver, I watched him operate, and I watched him open new markets. I watched the planning that went into it, and then the execution uh, that happened after it. And, and I, was, uh, I was always amazed uh, at, at, I was amazed at how it worked. Frank could butt heads with anybody. Did he ever butt heads with you, though? No. I, he probably didn't because I mean, of Elaine's good nature. But really. <laughs> um, but uh, there were very few people he didn't butt heads with at one time or another. And I remember there was someone who uh, Frank was always butting heads with. And I kept telling him, I said, you know, you need to butt back. and. Uh, I always thought that was interesting, but he loved it because after it was all yeah. over, you know, it was over and didn't make any difference. Didn't make, didn't make any difference at all. So, no, I, uh, I told her he'd be once he got something off his yeah. chest. Told him what he thought. You know, there'd be people laying on the floor. You know, like. <laughs> but then he'd look around and say, "Well, who wants to go to lunch?" Yeah, I mean, it right. was over. Yeah, was done. that's right. There were many exciting times, but the one thing that has always remained with me is um, it came to be known as a soybean crushing plant battle. Uh, the Purdue mill had been uh, built, and uh, but Frank knew that we had to have a soybean crushing plant in order to continue the quality control part of the company. He also realized that the company was going to have to borrow money. This would be the first time they had done it. Mr. Arthur had never borrowed a dime in his life. He was reluctant to do so, but Frank respected his dad and he spent much time with him trying to explain why they needed to do this. And Mr. Arthur trusted Frank enough to sign the loan agreement. Well, the plant got built in 1961 and it was extremely profitable. Well, lo and behold, in 1962, it was a group of 11 competitive poultry companies. They applied for a loan with the Area Redevelopment Administration, known as ARA, for a taxpayer subsidized loan of, it was 1.65 million with a 25 year payback. Now this group already had state and local approval. Even the first congressional representative, uh, who by the way was Frank's own congressman at that time, uh, both he and the governor of Maryland were backing this loan. Um, so it really looked like it was a done deal. Well of course we all know what Frank did. He persisted. And he got a lot of help. He got help from the National Soybean uh, Processors, local grain dealers, and a lot of other businesses who knew that this could happen to them. Now, Frank had been able to get a bank loan, and he sort of wondered why didn't they get a bank loan? Well, come to find out, they did not because the terms they were asking for at that time 
a commercial bank would not agree to for a, a project of that kind. The Wall Street Journal uh, realized that they were getting, we were getting a lot of support and they even ran a front page story of the support that Frank was getting. And finally, the late Congressman Roger C.B. Morton, um, he obtained a, um, it was a hearing before the Congressional, <coughs> excuse me, Congressional Oversight Committee, that was in May <coughs> of 1963. And um, at that time, Senator Bob Dole was a terrific interrogator of these poultry companies. And it was shown that this was not a viable loan to be made. Now, after almost a year, um, this battle was over. The loan was denied. That soybean plant has meant a world to the Eastern Shore, and uh, it's unbelievable that uh, what would we do with the soybeans if we didn't have the plant here? That was one of the biggest things that he did. Frank was a firm believer. Um, he was very close to the farming community, his roots. And he, he judged and, and, and took a lot of advice, I guess, if you would, from the farming community. He felt if you could work successfully with the farming community and they embraced you, then you had something to, you had potential. He was able to sit down with anybody and convince you of anything. And he always had that ability. And um, well, well, all the growers talk about him. Yeah. You know, when he went to the farms, they had lunch with him, or he'd come in and sit and talk. And yeah. because even though a farmer had, you know, crops, even cows, this was something else they could have on their farm, and it helped keep them viable. Yeah, it was another facet of their business. Yeah, I used to be surprised that Frank would come out to my house and visit and visit me. Uh, several times he did that. We sat down and we talked. We had refreshments. Uh, I even have some pictures of him. I used to see him quite, quite often. He was such a friendly person. I just want him to realize that Frank was, um, he was a tough man to grow a tender chicken, as he would say, you know, but um, he was a person person, you know. he. he we used to go to his house. We sit down, and I mean, he sit right beside the couch beside you, and say, "Is there anything that we can do for you?" You know, and it just made you feel like you were, you know, you were in the whole family. As I think he means so much to the area. Uh, he's put so much back into the area, and the type of employees that he hired, things like that, just mean so much. I mean. Uh, he always had the farmer in his heart. His devotion to that company and to his producers, I think, demonstrated um, a desire to not only be successful, but to make the people in his associates successful. So he put in the work that was required. He never expected anyone else to do any more than he was willing to exert himself to make the company what it has become. Um, he was just a family man who had a family business and wanted to allow us to get to know him a little bit differently than in the, the work setting all the time, but also wanted to get to know us as the people who were behind, um, the lives behind the grower operations that he had. In comparing Mr. Arthur and Frank, two totally different people. Mr. Arthur was conservative um, and, and had a reason to be. He went through the Great Depression and uh, Frank was a little more aggressive and go, go, but the two of them, they really worked together good. I think Jim is a mix of the two, the little Frank and the little Mr. Arthur. He and Frank had a, a great, great yeah, respect did. for each other. They yes, really they did. did. They really did. 
you know, and uh, he, Mr. Arthur, he kept saying, wouldn't come upstairs. Mm -hmm. But if he wanted to see Frank, he'd call up and Frank, good and Frank would be right there to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I guess the main thing that sticks in my mind is the fact that it's a family-owned company and it's succeeded over all these years. And uh, we always enjoyed interacting with Mr. Arthur, with Frank, Sandy, Ann, Beth, Jim, you know, and their spouses. And they've made you feel like part of mm -hmm. their family. I want the company to continue its focus on our, our values. I, I really do. Uh, don't leave them. The, the one thing that we've always had is that we've had that those guiding values to, to make sure that we make the right decisions. Uh, it wasn't like Jim immediately became the vice president of Purdue. He, he got to know the business and that was one of the things Frank wanted to do. Oh, Frank right. was just, oh, he was just thrilled. <laughs> he was so happy that Jim had made the decision. And he didn't pester him. I mean, Jim was on the West Coast with Jan, and he had Ryan at the time. And he had his degree, and I guess he just got thinking more about it and came back. But when he came back, uh, the way he started out, Jim had been a serviceman, I guess, a young uh, one. Well, he, he, before he, had, he, he, he had sort of gone into various facets yeah. for maybe a month or two weeks, right, something. Yeah. But then when he came back, he rotated from everything. He worked yeah. in quality control. He worked. He ran the plant. He worked the feed mill. He mm -hmm. was in sales. He sold chicken. Mm -hmm. He did everything, all the jobs, so he was familiar with. And that was perfect. It was easier for Frank because he did everything. He, he wanted Jim to get a hands-on experience. And, and as Jim got that experience and developed, Frank's comfort level and confidence in Jim grew. All the stats say third generation businesses don't normally last. Jim has done one awesome job with it. The, the most important thing is take care of the people. The, if, if you take care of your associates and then the associates will take care of the company. Jim was highly committed to the next big thing. That was one of the great things about Frank and Jim that I saw is that when they came in the plant, their conversation was not with the managers per se, but they wanted to talk to the people one-on-one -on -one to get the people's opinion on how they were being treated, how the plant was running, uh, what their needs were. Yeah, he's, uh, Jim's a good guy. I, uh, I just can't say enough about him. He's just a top-notch guy. Who was the best leader of Purdue? Was it Frank or Jim? And I, I've never been asked that question before, but I knew without thinking for a second, Frank was right for his time. And Jim is right for his time. It's just that simple. Don't get complacent and think you want to ride on that first hundred years. Too many companies have had a habit of trying to ride their name and most of the time it doesn't work. They're just on top of everything and that's just some of the things I feel like to me is very very important and the, and the close community contact always doing something within the community and um, proud to have the name Purdue behind it. Purdue speaks volumes. Purdue put the Eastern Shore on the map a lot more than anything else would have. Nobody said now, you used to say the Eastern Shore. Oh, you're close to Ocean City. Yep. And then it started changing. The East, oh, you're down there in that chicken country, Purdue. Think we are on the map. Yeah, there's no reason that uh, they won't be here for another hundred. You'll not forget the name of Purdue. People on the Eastern Shore are very glad that Purdue is here. They, uh, they also know that's where their bread and butter comes from. They touch a lot of lives, a lot of people. Their impact on the food industry 
is not limited just to the chicken they produce. So they have a responsibility, I think, to be good stewards of the honorable position that they have achieved. I believe that Purdue will continue to push the envelope to find that next big idea because they believe strongly in innovation. Purdue is not going to sit still and let the competition take over. Purdue is going to be right in the big middle of that, doing all the big things. And in fact, it probably will lead the pack. And I guess the final thing, do not lose that uh, dedication to best of class. That's what's made us and we need to stay there. He didn't mind working in his company. He done whatever it took. I was very proud to work for Purdue because of the, I guess because of Frank. He was a dedicated man. The, the, the family atmosphere that, that we have, uh, that Purdue have, is second to none. The people. I think uh, the most important thing, the associates and the bond that they have and working with them, like Kim said, the teamwork. At whatever level you were working, I think everybody worked together toward the company's purpose. And was always very fortunate to work for people that I respected and I felt they respected me. The main thing and, and the happiness that we get with growing and selling to Purdue is that we feel like we're always welcome. And a lot of people today I know still have their notes that Frank would personally write in his beautiful penmanship. They, they keep them uh, because he just wanted to tell them personally how much he appreciated the job they were doing. We're both been just proud to be a member of the Purdue family and the company for so many years. I think Elaine's already mentioned it, but it was the opportunity to work with the entire family. That, that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It really was. It, it meant the world to me uh, to be part of the Purdue family. Uh, I, uh, I have been treated like family. One of the things I think uh, that uh, may have uh, uh, promoted longevity uh, of service with the uh, Purdue Company uh, was the uh, with the growth of the company. Uh, uh, you, it was uh, a, something different and a challenge uh, every day. Uh, you look forward to uh, coming to work to uh, uh, see what that challenge was going to be and and see if you uh, and what you were going to do to uh, meet that challenge. You had a responsibility. They held you accountable, but it was it was a lot of fun um, meeting the accomplishments and the objectives uh, of the company back in that day. You were held accountable, and the company listened at the needs and uh, of what you uh, needed to make the job successful. I guess the bottom line is my opinion counted. Frank the managers and the people of the company, they value your opinion if you were doing that job. Culture of this company that got it started and the, and the work ethic that it had over the years. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I've seen so many people that worked their heartache every week. You didn't question. It, 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 wasn't, a, it wasn't a thing, it's not my job. It is my job. If this company's gonna keep going, it, I gotta get in there too. You didn't mind it. Why they stay at Purdue, uh, I think it was a, a great company with a great vision, uh, customer service, uh, with a management team that was very, uh, you know, engaging with the employees and the associates, cared about them as a team member, uh, developed them into, you know, professionals that had uh, additional and growing responsibility. I enjoyed the teamwork. And it was so important to me to work with those cross-functional team members across various parts of the company because they made it happen. 
effectively, on time, always. And it never happens without a team. That's the core of this company is people. And if you lose sight of your associates, and then you're done. When you have success, it should be recognized and recognized immediately, and it shouldn't be small. And we got great support from uh, Frank, Jim, and the managers of the operation. Now you can, you can imagine as busy as Frank and Jim and the rest of the guys were running the company to take time off during a given day to support a plant because they realized the milestone or, or objective as far as the uh, quality, agri-stats comp uh, competitive position or whatever that might have been. But uh, to see those guys to stop what they were doing and to be at that plant and talk to all the people and thank them for their, their uh, uh, contributions was truly amazing. What was the main reason that I was successful, I would say it was because of the people. I have a good relationship with them. For instance, I know sometimes the girls might get tired of me calling and check on the chickens, you know, what they did when they went out. If the information is not there, when I call, they will call me back and give me the information. And the person that always calls to put the chickens in, you know, move the chickens out, she is always pleasant, you know, to tell me what time they're going, and do you want me to repeat, you know, whatnot. Okay. They're just precious to me. They want to make sure that everything's right, and. And we just liked that atmosphere, and um, that's what we did, and we just, just have loved it the whole time. I'm proud to grow for Purdue because the uh, flock advisors, the chickens are fine, and the uh, whole administration that I've dealt with were fantastic and very truthful. Well, growing with Purdue, it's a family thing. I mean. They all, when I started out, Mr. Frank was a very friendly person. He was, visited our house quite a bit. One of the things is having a good service person. Um, they can help you in a lot of ways. They can tell you things that you're not doing it, to improve so you grow a better quality chicken. And that is what produced after a good quality chicken. Here on the Eastern Shore, if we didn't have Purdue, I don't know what would happen to people because Purdue employs so many people. And everybody on the Eastern Shore knows Purdue. I think the most important values of Purdue, I guess, are that, that you know someone that you can talk to particularly if you have a, a problem or if you need some market quotes or something, you know, some, someone you can contact and, and develop a, a little bit of a relationship with them over time. And we felt pretty honored that Frank wouldn't come out and just chit-chat, you know, about growing chickens. Some of our fond memories with Frank. Frank and Mitzi used to host dinners at their home and we've been there several yeah. times you know, with other poultry growers and we would dine together very casually and meet other growers. What does it mean to me to be a member of the Purdue family at the turn of 100 years and at 38, uh, 39 years of my employment? And I can sum that up in, uh, in two words, um, proud and grateful. I'm proud to have been part of it, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. He liked to tell how Andrew Carnegie, on being asked if he could build his steel empire over again, answered, you could take away my steel plants and I could do it, but if you took away the people who helped me build this steel empire, I could never do it again. 
And Frank did believe in those two philosophies. My, my, my. Purdue was a leading, innovative company, I, we think, of the 21st century, and it's a repeat of what we just said. Creating, changing with the times, creating what's needed, and still trying to protect the environment, because let's face it, in this business, helping to protect the environment is a truly tough job, and I think Purdue's been uh, very respected in that line, and I'm sure it'll continue. So I think in order to keep growing, to improve on anything, you have to adapt to change. A lot of people don't like change, but when you see how change can make a huge difference in how you grow chickens, how it affects you know, the environmental issues and everything else, Purdue is just always up there. They're always one step above on anything, so. They have added phytates to the feed, which has resulted in a dramatic reduction in the amount of phosphorus that goes through the bird and that is ultimately ends up in the uh, litter that we end up using as a fertilizer. That has been a tremendous help from an environmental standpoint uh, to address both the fertilizer needs that we have but also to do it in a manner that's environmentally responsible. They also, um, you know, brought uh, heightened awareness to tunnel ventilation and improving the environmental quality within the house has always been a strong point of Purdue, but you know, 20 years ago when that was introduced here on the shore, that was a big step forward, a very expensive step. And Purdue stepped in during that process to make sure that producers were adequately compensated for those improvements. So those innovations don't come just at the expense of the producer. They've attempted to partner with that um, to make those innovations possible. They are committed to quality and uh, not only in the product that we grow, but they're committed to the environment, to the community. Um, a lot that they're involved in, it just shows that they care about the peninsula, Eastern Shore. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's what I'm speaking for is Eastern Shore here. At one time, I calculated how many millions of chickens that we were able to supply to the world it's just uh, mind-boggling that we can be a part of that. And he proceeded to tell me that there's probably nothing I'll do in my career any more important than being a supporter of the community and what the United Way can bring to the organization. They give back. The company has been giving back for so many years and the, the, this community wouldn't be what it is today without Purdue and without all the effort that they've put into helping all these organizations. You're just involved all the time with our community organizations. And I mean, just a lot of time and effort go, goes into it and, uh, and we believe in it. I mean, it's, it's, you have to be, you have to be, you're part of that community. We finally agreed that providing needed employment for people, we just felt like that was the most important thing they've done because Wherever Purdue went, uh, it was like in North Carolina. It was, uh, it was really needed in that area. It gave jobs that just weren't available. Ackett Wheat uh, was very, very uh, community-minded. We was uh, done things in the community. Uh, the main, well, one of the things we done, which was my baby, was the March of Dimes. We uh, raised money for the March of Dimes each year. Uh, anywhere from seventy to one hundred thousand uh, dollars. United Way, we raised money for uh, Relay for Life, and that's the kind of things that I feel that we need to continue to do as the company move forward. We need to make sure we stay big in the community. Personal assets were put into the Purdue Foundation, uh, and again, with the idea that that was to. Uh, help the communities where Purdue did business. You know, mostly, you know, whether it be Delmarva, North Carolina, Georgia, wherever 
Purdue had a presence, he wanted us to be able to use that foundation to make improvements in the communities and have it last beyond his personal uh, life, life, but you know, basically go on forever, and that's what the what the family foundation does. And I think the family is committed to that and uses that uh, to to you know provide a a brand uh, excellence for the company and make us make people aware that we're here in the community and trying to serve the community. So I was on the board of directors for for 13 years uh, of the Maryland Food Bank. And I was always, never questioned about, what, you know, what are you doing at the food bank? It was, it, was, it was always, that's his passion, and we're supporting him on it. And the company always supported it with product, and they supported it with financials, and they supported it with allowing me the time to, to really do a good job for that. I think the company viewed that community service as a reflection of not only me, but a reflection of the company. And what would Salisbury be like if we didn't have Purdue? You got to remember the number of people in this area that rely on the money from the chicken people, the people that worked at Purdue. Um, it was big. It was big. I mean, if 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 they weren't here, people would know it. Sir. Absolutely.